Hey, listen, I want to preach to you today. I'm going to take a little bit of time. I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm, like uh, I'm going to wind up just a little bit, but trust me, when I get there, it's going to be spitting fire. Come on, somebody. So when, I, when it's time to go, it's time to go. If you're wearing dentures, close your mouth because you'll suck them straight back your throat. We're going to go so fast. If you've got a wig on, just put your hand on your head because it's going to blow off in your neighbor's face. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to preach. I'm sorry about that. I want to preach today. Listen. I want to preach today. He gets the final word. I, I got a word for somebody. I mean, I'll be for everybody, but I know I got a word from some for somebody in this room today. I want to preach to you today. He gets the final word. Can, can I tell you one thing about Jesus and that is this is if you only know him in paper, his power is very limited in your life. But when you know him in person and you have a personal relationship with Christ and you trust him at his word and you let his voice speak into your life above every other voice around you, including your own inner critic, and you'll give him the final word about your situation, his power is limitless when you move him from paper to person. When you allow him to be real, when you allow his voice to be real, when you allow what he says about you to be truer than anything anyone else has said about you, you will live an exponentially abundant life full of the power and miracles of God. And I want to help somebody in this room. I, I'm going I'm to look into a story that, that you've probably heard but maybe never heard this way. And this is something that just, it just it's been all over me for a number of of months now, and I just felt released to preach it to you here today. John chapter 21 is where we're going to draw our text from today on He Gets the Final Word, and, and allow me just a few minutes to lay out some of the text and a little bit of the background of the text, and then we'll go somewhere with it this morning. John chapter 21, if you got to say amen. Oh, that's because you don't have a Bible. You're waiting for it to go on the screen. <laughs> Listen, if you don't care about your own discipleship, why should we? Come on, somebody. No, I'm just kidding. You... They're, they're going to put it on, a, on the screen for you. Or you can turn uh, in your, in your uh, digital Bible to John chapter 21. I, listen, I feel too much at home right now. I'm going to tell you that right now. I should just stop it and just be like, I'm, I'm a visiting guest here in this house. John chapter 21, verse 1 says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. So this is a post-resurrection reality of Christ in their life. After this, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. That's important. It happened this way that Simon Peter and then Thomas, also known as Didymus. The disciples called him T. Diddy. That's what they called him. <laughs> Evidently, you don't know the Greek. Simon Peter and T. Diddy. <laughs> And Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were gathered together. I just, I, I was reading that and I, I got tickled. I, 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 got, I literally laughed out loud because I thought, man, he's going down the list. John just, just is naming names, like name dropping. Can you imagine? This is a letter being written that's circulating in your area. You hear that John's letter is arriving at your little house church and they get to this story and they start laying it out. It's at the Sea of Galilee and he appeared again. You start being familiar. Oh, man, I was there. I was a part of it. And they're like, and Simon Peter was there, and T. Diddy was there. And you're like, watch, bro, he's going to name me next. And he's like, and two other disciples. And you're like, wait, what happened? What? I don't know if John submitted to an editor, and he's like, you got too many words here. And he's like, who should I get rid of? Those two guys right there. They played no significant role whatsoever. I don't even know why they were there. And two other disciples were together. Peter's like, I'm going fishing, yo. Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat. And that same night, they caught nothing. And early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore by the disciples. Listen, and they did not realize it was Jesus. I thought about that for myself. How often have I missed him in the middle of my failure and my frustration? And I hope today as we move through this passage and we preach through this text today that you will see Jesus fresh again in your life and realize he's been there every step of the way. 
He's here right now in this room, and you might not even be aware of it. And my goal and my desire to preach this message today is to help you see he's standing right with you. In the middle of your failure, in the middle of your frustration, in the middle of empty nets, in the middle of an all-night-long toiling, and nothing has turned out the way you thought it was, I want you to know Jesus is still right there with you. He's with you. He called out to them and said, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your nets to the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because the number was so large. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, I think that's funny because that's John. John's a four-letter word. He couldn't put the two other disciples' names in there, but he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved when his name is four letters. I see you, John. It is the Lord, John says. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, here it is, they saw a fire of burning coals, and there was fish on it, and there was some bread. He gets the final word. I think God has something in this place for us, and I'm hoping I can preach it the way that God wants it to be preached, that you can be set free in some areas in your life today. Can we pray and then we'll jump into it. Father, we are so grateful to be in this room and in your presence. The the, the worship has set the atmosphere. Our hearts are before you. And so I ask God right now that you would give me revelation for this room. That this word would not just be some word that I preach. It's not just a message. It's a moment that captures us and brings us into a real experience with you where you move from paper to person in our life. And we are enveloped by your presence and we see you in a way we've never seen you before and we are set free. Set free. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Let me give a little background to this story in our text because I think it's very interesting if you study the book of John. John is one of my favorite gospels. And it is uh, uh, considered the fourth gospel or the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are the synoptics because they all kind of tell similar stories with a few little caveats and a few little add-ons. And, and John is the youngest disciple by far, and so he's had the longest to live, and he actually writes his gospel after the others have been written. So he's surveyed all of them, heard all the stories, and he says, I, I, I realize there's some stuff that everybody's saying, but there's some other stuff that I want to say about Jesus, and he's very particular about everything that he's going to say. I mean, he's had time to measure it out. His gospel is at least 20 years after the last gospel was written, and so he's had a lot of time to measure it, so every word is calculated. And, and, and John has really thought about this deeply, and he doesn't even decide to start with Jesus' birth in the narrative. He goes all the way back to the beginning. He's like, I've been thinking about this so long, I'm going back to the beginning. And he says, in the beginning, not the beginning of Jesus' life, Life, but the beginning of everything. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? He, he's going all, he brings this whole gospel narrative into a divine plan that is bigger than all of us. That's something that God's been working on for a really long time. That, 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 that it makes sense to John now to see God in a, in a different way because he experienced Christ. He, he saw God in a completely different way and stories begin to make sense to him. And he, he just found God to be so mind-blowing that he made it a cosmic gospel and brought all the planets and all the solar systems and everything that was ever created into this gospel of Christ. He brought all philosophies and all religions and he centered them right in the middle of Christ. He, he saw something in Jesus he didn't see in anyone else and it totally blew his mind and I started thinking about this if he's so exact on what he's writing this this feels so awkward to me because if you read the book of John you read the first 20 chapters and in chapter 20 it feels like he ended the gospel I mean he he starts talking about you know he he unfolds these seven signs 
that, that represents something so significant to him about Jesus. It's, you ought to read the book of John. It's, it's phenomenal. And he, he lays out these seven different signs that, that he says, if I could present a picture of this cosmic God to you in this man, Christ Jesus, and the redemptive plan of God throughout history, he, he unfolds these seven signs. But he says, but that's not all there was. There were so many more signs. I just I couldn't get them all in this book. And he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And it feels like that's it. That's how John 20 ends. He tied it up in a bow, and you're thinking, I'm going to turn the next page, I'm going to turn on to another book. No, you turn to chapter 21. And if I was like, why did you keep going when it felt like you just closed it out? And, and theologians call this the epilogue of John. Everybody say epilogue. epilogue. Now, I know that we don't use the word epilogue very often. We use more uh, lines of stuff like P.S. Come on. Anybody know what? Postscript. P.S. Postscript. When you're writing a letter. A letter you don't know what letters are. Okay, letters are <laughs> this ancient technology <laughs> called paper. And you don't, you, don't te- you don't type it out with your thumbs. You use your thumb, your first finger, and your middle finger to hold a pencil. Come on, somebody. And you, and you write letters. How many of you ever written a letter with a little P.S.? And, and the P.S. was like, it wasn't necessarily an afterthought. It was like a thought that actually encompassed the whole thing. And you were like, this really says it better than I said it before. And so i got to say it in a way that's going to be so profound. And you add a little P.S. to it. And, and if you, like me in grade school, you weren't only good at writing, you were good at origami. Come on, somebody. Because then you folded that thing 16 times and you pulled the neck out and it became a little swan. And you like let it float over to the little girl that you want to talk to. I can tell the young people aren't believing me in this room. They don't know about this paper stuff. So I brought some archaeological evidence with me to show you that there is this stuff called paper. Can we get evidence number one on the screen right here? Here it is. This is a, this is a good P.S. Oh, I can't even, Can you shrink it down? I can't see it all. Can you, it says, do you like me? Do you like me? Check yes or no. How many have done a little check yes or no before? Come on, somebody. Check yes or no. And then watch. So he writes that, and then it's different down the bottom because that's like darker. This is lighter color. So he sends it to a girl, I'm just guessing. And then and she writes back, I don't know. I don't know myself yet. <laughs> Plus, I'm under a lot of stress at home. So I just really can't tell. And then she writes, P.S., you don't really know yourself until you're 18. Come on, somebody. Like, I am... I am baffled by the wisdom <laughs> that she's mature enough to know she's not mature enough to know. I love it. P.S. I just want you to know, here's what I'm trying to say. You're not, you don't really know either. We don't know yet. We're just eight, we're not even 18. I like this next one. I don't know if it's going to be, leg- okay. All right. These are so big. I, I don't even remember what they say. I don't, know what they, I don't know what they say, so I, I, I had them up there, but this one says, I'm breaking up with you, right? Pretty clear. And then he's like, P.S., happy anniversary, though. <laughs> and below that, it says, we made it one month. One month. He's like, girl, they said we weren't going to make it, but we made it one month. We shut down all their lies. And then right below that, it says, P.S., I want you to know this really hurts writing this letter. <laughs> He's like, girl, I got so attached to you in a month. I don't know how to tell you this, but this hurts deeply, <laughs> deeply. The next one, I don't know if I'm going to be able to read it or not, but it's, it's a P.S. and I, It's my favorite, actually. Okay, so we, we got some of it. it. Does it scroll? Does it do anything but that? <laughs> okay. Let me, let me pull it up for you. Let's do this. Bear with me. This is so good. It's worth it. It's worth it. Here's what it says. Here's what it says. Dear, in air quotes, tooth fairy. I don't believe in the tooth fairy anymore. I know it's you who gets the money and puts it under my pillow, mom and dad. I'm sorry if this is hard for you, but I'm nine now. Like, P.S. I don't believe in Santa Claus either. Love, Lexi. P.S. Daddy, I knew it was you last Easter hiding those Easter eggs. I've known for a whole year. The gig's up. I know who you are. I love it. So good. (laughs) If you're mad at me because your kid's in here, there's kids' church, and they should be in there. That's what I'm telling you right now. (laughs) It's a plug for kids' church. (laughs) The power, listen, 
of a P.S. John actually puts a P.S. in his letter. He's, he's, he's remembering, he's laid out the signs. He's like, I can't just keep adding signs, but there is one more story that captivated me so deeply that showed me something about Jesus that I never saw anywhere else that it completely transformed everything about my life. P.S., i got to tell you this. And he begins to talk about breakfast. Breakfast? Like, what does, I don't even like breakfast. You might be a breakfast person. I didn't get fat by eating breakfast. I'm going to tell you that right now. Like, like I, I'm not, so, so I'm already I'm trying to opt out of the story. Like, I don't understand breakfast, but, but it's beyond breakfast. It's, it's John dropping a PS. The whole story in the first 20 chapters is cosmic in nature. It's huge. He starts out as big as you possibly can, that this is the God who created everything. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then he shrinks him down in verse 14 and says that Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then we walk Watch that grace and truth fill the earth and miracle after miracle, crowd after crowd. And he lays cosmic and brings it down smaller and smaller and smaller. And they close the chapter, verse 20, and then he brings it down to one man, Peter. It's like John's writing a P.S. to Peter. Now, likely Peter's dead and gone by the time this goes. But John was so captured by the singularity of how Jesus handled Peter. It's, it's remarkable what he's done with the planets, but it's unbelievable how he handled Peter. What, what he did in Peter's life, it struck a chord so deeply in John. And so John writes this narrative. He starts talking about Peter is on the Sea of Galilee, and he's on a boat, and he hasn't caught anything. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, that is so reminiscent of the time that Jesus found Peter. Just three and a half years ago, Peter was on the same shore, in the same boat, in the same sea, in the same predicament, empty. He fished all night long and caught nothing. And can you imagine Peter now, three and a half years later, after all he saw, after all he'd been through, after all he'd experienced, he's now back to the same place he was three and a half years ago. Peter feels like a failure. He feels overwhelmed. Now that he's back to the start, he's caught nothing all night long until Jesus gets involved in his life. If you're taking notes, if you care to take notes, the first point I want to make today is that John is pulling out of this story a familiar failure. You have it and I have it. We all have a familiar failure. This is reminiscent of Peter in Luke chapter 5 where Jesus found him. John's just pulling it out again and says, the way that Jesus ended his earthly ministry with Peter is the same way he started. And he started in a place where he's calling him from emptiness. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, he had abundance. And now he's coming back to the same place. Peter has fallen so far. And he's reminded of his familiar failure. We all have familiar failures in our lives. We're thinking, we've been walking with Jesus for so long. How is it that we keep having this same problem over and over again? Why can't I shake this thing in my life? How is it I keep going back to this same place? I thought I'd be over this by now. I thought that last service I was in where I felt that touch and everything was going to be good. And then two weeks later, I'm in the same predicament I was in before. And we lock ourselves down in a familiar failure. So I'm not giving a license to sin. That's not what I'm trying to say. But all of us have this thing. It's like we're wondering at times in our journey with Christ, how am I back in the same place I was when he found me? How did I get into this? But how have I not been able to stand and shake off the stuff in my life that's keeping me in this place? We all have it. A familiar, as I'm talking about it right now, you know what it is. It's the thing the devil beats you up over all the time. It's the thing you beat yourself up over all the time. It's the thing you don't want anybody else to know about because they think you're doing well. And if they really knew, like testimony service is only going to go so far for me. I'm going to tell you the good stuff that's happened. I don't want you to know that thing that for the last 15 years I haven't seemed to get out of my life. I keep walking forward, but it feels like I'm walking backwards. Are you hanging with me in the house? John is pulling out a familiar failure 
in Peter's life. And, and, and think about it, in both of this, in John chapter 21 and in Luke chapter 5, in both these cases, Peter is coming off an abject, abject complete failure of fishing. And this is a problem because Peter's a professional fisherman and he sucks at it. <laughs> both times he comes up empty. And the only, matter of fact, the only time we ever see Peter fishing and he's a professional fisherman, he catches nothing. In his own strength, his own, and you got to realize, Peter doesn't even want to be doing what he's doing. You, back then, you didn't pick your profession. Your profession picked you. It was often handed down in some kind of way. And so Peter's just being, being ha handling something that was handed down to him. Can, can I just tell you in this room, let me just kind of turn it just a little bit and make sense of it. There's a lot of stuff that's been handed down to you from another generation. Because what doesn't get handled, it gets handed down. And he's been handed something that he doesn't even want and doesn't like and he's not good at. And it makes him feel like a failure in his life. And he's fighting to feel better about himself. And until Jesus shows up on the scene every time we see it, he keeps coming up empty in his own strength to get over and get through what a thing is that's been put on his life. He wants to be successful. He wants to find something and some grace and give some power to himself to feel good about himself. But he keeps coming up empty until Jesus shows up in his life. And when Jesus shows up in his life, he takes his failure and turns it into fruitfulness and says, as long as you're going to ride with me, I'll continue to bless your life. I'll continue to bring you into abundance. But if you're going to go back to the places you've been before, life without me is empty. And if you're ever in moments of emptiness, you need to ask yourself, did I get back on the boat that he found me on? Am I still lingering on the shores that he called me away from? Am I still meddling in business that I have no business in anymore? He changed my profession and said, you're no longer going to be fishing this way. You're going to be fishing for men. Did, did I reverse that and go back to the place that he called me out of? Am I making sense to anybody else in the room? In chapter one, he's back to the start after a massive failure. And, and, and I think it's, it's, it's understandable that he's put all of his eggs in Jesus' basket. Jesus has been crucified. But, but, but I, I used to read this thinking this was a crisis of, of Peter's faith in Christ, but it's not. Because Jesus already showed up to him three times. It's, it's not a crisis of Peter believing that Jesus is who he says he is. Listen to me. It's a crisis of believing that he is who Jesus says he is. Because he has a familiar failure. I don't think your problem at all is that you don't believe. You wouldn't be here if you didn't believe Jesus is who he says he is. I think he showed up in your life, and I think you've studied it enough, and I think you're leaning in deep enough that you realize, yes, Jesus is who he says he is. The hard pill for you to swallow is that you are who Jesus says you are because you're constantly reminded of a familiar failure in your life, and you're thinking, how could he love me, and how could he use me, and how could he want anything in my life? He may have wanted me at one time, but certainly he doesn't want me now because I keep finding myself back in this same boat. I already got a headache. I can't preach harder than this. I'm just going to tell you that right now. It hurts right here. It hurts right here. Jesus already showed up to him three times. Let me, let, me just, let me just digress and show you these three times because this is how Jesus does it. Jesus showed the first time. The first time Jesus shows up to his, Peter's there, he shows up to a crowd of disappointed people. They're all disappointed because, because they're, they're thinking it was supposed to go one way. And it didn't go the way they're supposed to go. So the Bible says they shut themselves in. But, but how many know Jesus doesn't care if you shut yourself in, you still can't shut him out. And so Jesus said, you may have put a lock on the door, but I'm going to put a hole in the wall. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to come in, and I'm going to be there in the middle of your disappointment. And can I tell you that you may be sitting here disappointed because life hasn't turned out the way you thought it was going to turn out. But Jesus is about to break into your life and say, hey, it may not have turned out the way you thought it was going to turn out. But if I'm in the room, it's better than you ever thought it could be. Because now you have miracle power. Now you have transforming power. Now you have power in my name because it didn't turn out the way you thought it was going to turn out but it's even better because I put my hand on it in your life. He stepped into disappointment. He stepped into disappointment and then the second time because, because uh, T. Diddy wasn't there the first time he showed up. So now he moves from stepping into disappointment to stepping into disbelieving. 
He'll come into the disbelieving people's lives. He, he shows up to old Diddy because Diddy's like, I don't believe. You know, like Diddy missed church. You know how you miss church sometimes? And you're like, how'd it go? And they're like, oh my gosh, amazing. You wouldn't even believe how awesome it was. And you're like, no, oh, Jesus showed up. And they're like, I know where two or three are gathered together. And you're like, no, 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 listen, listen. He literally walked in the room and you weren't there. Are you hearing me? Like, and you're like, I don't believe you. And so Diddy's like, I don't believe it until I feel the nail prints in his hand, until he proves himself to me. Can I just tell you, Jesus does not have to prove himself to anybody. But he does it anyway. Like, like he, he doesn't have to come. I don't care. You may be a skeptic in the room, and, and, and he'll, he doesn't have to. He's the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He doesn't have to, yet he still comes to you over and over and over again and showing up in your life. The car wreck should have taken you out. The divorce should have caused you to just quit on everything. You should have never got your mind back. Your health should have never recovered. But Jesus shows up anyway and says, put your hand in my hand and feel the nail prints in my hand. Put your hand in my side and see that I am who I say. He doesn't have to keep proving himself over and over again, but that you might believe he shows up and says, here I am. Here I am again. He shows up to the disappointed. He shows up to the disbelieving. And thirdly and finally, he shows up to the disqualified. And that's where we find Peter. P people who feel disqualified because Peter failed big time. He denied him three times. When he said he wouldn't do it, he's like, look, all y'all, everybody else at Journey Church, they're going to turn their back on you. Not this, old boy. And he denies him three times, one time in front of a 13-year-old girl. Like, aren't you one of them disciples? He's like, heck no. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? You, you, I think he's, he's doubting, not that Jesus is who he says he is, but that he is who Jesus says he is. Because you've got to remember, Mark chapter 8, when you're standing at Caesarea Philippi, and there's a big crack in the rock there where that's the gate of hell, and that's where all demonic worship took place, and all kinds of lustful and sexual sin happened, the conjuring of spirits. They thought all evil spirits and all gods reign from that place. And Jesus is standing there with his disciples, and he, he looks at Peter, who he calls Peter, who used to call Simon, which meant pebble, and now he calls him Peter, which means rock. And he says, Peter, I want you to know, upon this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell won't be able to, to stand against it. And Peter's reminded, man, he said some great things about my life. He brought me into great places. I remember when he put his hand on my life. I remember when he anointed me for this generation. How am I back in the boat after he said all that about me? And he feels like a failure in his life. You know there's stuff that God said about you. People's prophesied to you. Words you've got from God that haven't happened yet. And the devil wants you to believe because of your familiar failure, you have fallen too far from God's hand to actually do what God said he was going to do. Are you hearing me in the house? And so, so Peter, Peter's in this place where he goes back to the boat to fish. And so Jesus shows up. And here, here, we're going here, to fast forward. So listen, if you've got dentures, then close your mouth. Come on, somebody. Watch this. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? I love this because first he calls out to them, then he calls them out. He's like, hey, friends, you're terrible at fishing. He, he, when Jesus asks you a question, how many know he's not asking because he doesn't know the answer? He's like, I wonder if they caught any fish. Because I'd really like to cook them fish, but if they don't have any fish, what are we going to do? I'm at loss. He says, friends, and can I just tell you, real godly friends will call you out when you've gone back to places of emptiness and when you've returned back to boats that you shouldn't be on. Godly preaching will call you out. I mean, I, lo I love good, exciting, fun, inspirational church, but every now and then, you need to be called out. You, you, friend, I love you, but I want you to know I also see you in your failure. And I found you in your failure. And I want to know why you're back in your failure because you don't need to live in that place. I've already released you from that place. So why are you living in that place? And he brings him back to the same place he found him in the first time to say, hey, I know where you're at and I still have the power to change your situation. 
You, you've, go, you've gone back, and godly friends will call you out when you've gone back to the boat, and they'll say things like, oh, okay, okay, okay. This, this, how, this, this is a good question to learn in the repertoire when you want to call out your friends. Simple. Hey, hey, how's that going for you? Now it's your back on that. How's that working out for you? You said you were never going back to her. She back. How's that working out for you? You said you were going to quit that and never go back to that again. Now you're back at it. So how's that working out for you? Do you have more peace because of that? Is there more joy in your life because of that? Or do you feel empty? Because every time you go back to a boat he called you out of, you end up empty every single time. And he just calls, that's what Christ is doing. He just calls, hey, hey, friends, hey, I just want to, I want to remind you, I'm, I can give you fullness. If you're in a boat that's leading to emptiness, maybe you're in the wrong boat. Maybe you need to come back out of that boat and let me fill your life again. And that, that's just, that's the question that gets asked. And so Peter, I love Peter because Peter tells the truth. He didn't have to. I mean, Peter's a fisherman. All fishermen lie. You know what I'm talking about? Like, About that big right there? How big is that fish about that big right there? I mean, it's like in the, in the in the apprenticeship of fishermanship. Here's how you lie. And Peter came like, it's all good. It's all good. And said, hey, how's that working out for you? It's not. And, and that's, that's what Christ is trying to do in this room right now. He, he, he's, he's calling for a relocation of your life so he can bring you into something that he wants to bless your life with. Because here, here's the reason why. God won't fix what you fabricate. God won't heal what you're not willing to reveal. Come on, somebody. Let me tell somebody this. He won't speak life into what you continually speak lies about. And we've got so good at lying about our position that we believe we're in a good position. You know, the Bible says, how dark is it when they call light, when they call darkness light? They don't even realize anymore how dark it is. They think this is light. And we've lied so much about our position. We're so stuck in what we're in. We're lying about what we're lying about. We're lying to ourselves and lying to everybody else. And Jesus has to break in there and says, I'm going to give you a moment to be honest. And if you'll be honest with yourself, I can fill your life. I can get you out of that boat and I can change everything about your life. I just need you to be honest. Oh, I'm preaching harder than you're praising. That's all I can tell you right now. How's it working for you? How's it working for you? Listen, your breakthrough happens in your honesty. Do you have peace? Do you have joy? Is there hope in your life? Is there purpose? Doing relationships God's way? Are you doing relationships? Are you doing business God's way? Are you doing life God's way? Every other way leads to emptiness. And Peter says, no, I'm not. And maybe for you it's I thought the money would bring me peace. No. Nope. I thought the relationship would bring me joy. It hasn't. I thought lowering my standards would raise my success and lead to fulfillment, but it hasn't. I'm back in the same boat I was in before, and I don't have the peace I thought I would have. And Jesus' answer was, throw your nets to the other side. I I'm, I'm closing. You're, you're wrestling around. I'm closing. Now, think how stupid this is. These are fishermen. It, it, we're not talking about the Titanic. We're talking about a six-foot John boat. So it was probably five feet from the left side to the right side. And Jesus is like, hey, I know. I know, what I know what the answer is. You just take it from the left side. If you move it five feet to the right side, you'll catch stuff. And they're probably thinking, this is so stupid. Why are we even trying this? Because, because here's what I want you to know. Oftentimes, Jesus won't release the impossible over your life until you're willing to do the impractical thing he asks you to do. That doesn't make sense. And a lot of us are stuck on impractical. Why would I tithe? That's so impractical. Why would I not do with my body what I want to do with my body? Why would I not sleep with whoever I want to sleep? That's just impractical, Joe. You got to kick the tires. Come on, somebody. I need you women to realize when a guy says you got to kick the tires, he just called you a piece of rubber. He thinks nothing more of you than he thinks of a car. You really want me sleeping with that guy? Oh, no, I'm meddling. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> Don't release me. It gets really bad from here. <laughs> Jesus said, throw your nets on the other side. How could forgiveness really work to release me from this pain I feel? That just seems so impractical. To forgive, and then I'm set free, and then I'm made whole again. I mean, think about Naaman. Naaman has leprosy. He's literally falling apart. His life is falling apart. Leprosy ate your skin. Nose would fall off. Ears would fall off. Fingers would fall off. And he comes to the prophet and says, hey, I believe you have power from God. I, I need you to heal me. I brought a bunch of money, an entourage of people to show you how powerful I am. And the prophet says, go to the muddiest river in our region, the Jordan River, and dunk yourself seven times. He's like, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. Starts to walk away. And his, 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 uh, his servant came to him and said, if he'd asked you to do something hard, you would have done it. He has to do something so easy you can't do it. And so he lays his pride down and he goes and dips in the Jordan River seven times. He comes up and the Bible says his, ba his, his skin was like baby skin. Completely healed. Because oftentimes God won't release the impossible until you're willing to do the impractical thing he's asking you to do. All right. I got to go. When they landed, here it is. I'm closing. When they landed, can, can we have somebody come out? Play, you, you're out of here. Play something like in minor chords. It sounds more spiritual when it's on minor chords. So, so deep. Listen, when they landed, I'm, I'm closing. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, and there was fish on it. Now listen to me. Listen to me. It, 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 and I know we don't study Greek a lot, but this word for fire in the Greek is an unused... Most of the time in the Greek, when you use the word fire, it wasn't this word. Matter of fact, you can find it nowhere else in the scripture except one other time that John uses it in his gospel in chapter 18. This, this concept of fire burning coals, it shows up nowhere else. This Greek word shows up nowhere else in scripture except in John 18. And let me tell you what John 18 says. When the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of that man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. And now the servant and the officers who had made a fire of coals. There it is again. In Peter's greatest failure, John's reminded. John, John's drawing a picture. He, he had so much time to think about this. And he decided to draw the passage to. There was fire of coals sitting on the shore. Bam. Peter denies Christ at the fire of coals, watch, and he stood there for it was cold and he warmed himself with them. And Peter stood with them. He stopped standing with Jesus and he started standing. Can you imagine every time Peter saw a fire with burning coals, it reminded him of the time he failed Jesus. I don't know what it is that reminds you of your failure. I don't, I don't know what it keeps reminding you of you're less than and you're not good enough and you keep making mistakes and you've got a familiar failure. For Peter, it was a fire of coals and, and Jesus is over there knowing they're out there, they've caught nothing and he builds a little fire of coals and he's setting up the scene to get the final word in Peter's life. And Peter shows up and there's a fire of coals and, and, and listen, and then Jesus starts having this conversation with him because Peter denied him three times. Jesus starts asking Peter, do you love me? And he allows him to give three confessions to overrule the three times he walked away. He said, John's like, I couldn't believe the scene I saw setting before my eyes because the fall of a Talmud was irreparable. If you, if you were called forth by a rabbi and then you denied that rabbi and his teaching, you were never, not only in that rabbi's Talmudim, you could never get in there any rabbi. No one would touch you. You were cast away. And you were never brought back into this inner circle again. And so John's saying, and you got to think, John, John and Peter had a little riff in the scriptures. And John's human. I bet you when Peter denied Christ, John's thinking, finally, that idiot is out of here. He'll never be back. And John's watching this scene unfold in his PS. Are you following me in this moment? And he's saying, something took place before my eyes that I couldn't fathom. This restoration and redemption I'd never seen before. I never saw this kind of love 
in my entire life who would reach for somebody who kept falling over and over and over again and still keep offering them grace and a hand of fellowship and a reconciliation and bringing them back to the table and using I never, it blew my mind. It was so transformative to my theology. I have to add it to my story as a PS. His love is overwhelming. His grace is unbelievable. You wouldn't imagine how far he'll go to get you. You wouldn't imagine what he'll overcome to bring you back in. You can't imagine how much God loves you. You can't imagine how much God wants you. You can't imagine what he'll overturn, what traditions he'll speak against, what stuff he'll call off your life. You can't imagine how he'll bring you back from a fallen place and restore your life and make you fall again. You just can't imagine it. It's bigger than you could ever think. It's more than you've ever imagined. And here's the deal. Jesus gets the final word because not only is there a fire of coals, there's a fish on the fire. If the fire represents Peter's failure, then the fish represents God's faithfulness. And and Jesus said, just before I leave for the last time, I got to get the final word in this place. I don't want you to ever look at a fire of burning coals and remember your failure alone. I want you to remember my faithfulness every time. I'm changing it all right here. I'm providing a meal right here where I'm going to draw you to this moment. The next time you see what should look like a failure, you're going to remember my faithfulness my hand that holds you and picks you up. His love, his love. Number three, he gets the final word. And listen, listen, I'm closing with this right here. I know I've said that three times, I promise now. I said, God, what do you want to tell Journey Church? What do you want to tell the people here today? And I just felt like I'm going to to say it to you the way he told it to me. Here it is. He said, tell them, P.S., I still love you. Listen, he said, P.S., it's not over yet. P.S., I haven't given up on you. P.S., what you did doesn't define you. I still love you. I still have plans for your life. I still have redemption for you. I still have purpose written all over you. You might have think you failed miserably, but I'm gonna put a fish on it today and show you my faithful hand. P.S. I still love you. It's not over. God's not done. He's getting ready to do a a restoration in your life that's going to blow your mind. A restoration in your marriage that you never thought was going to come back together again. He's going to restore things in your life that you failed miserably in. And you know you failed miserably in. But he's about to restore it and give you hope. And bring you back. Because he still loves you. Would you stand with me all over this place? Listen to me. Whatever you did... It wasn't enough to undo what he did for you. Whatever you did, it wasn't enough to undo what he did for you. Let me just go to Luke chapter 5 real quick. When Jesus showed up that first time on the scene, the Bible said there were two boats on the sea. And Jesus decided to get into Peter's boat. He had options. He didn't have to get in Peter's boat, but he chose Peter. Can I just tell you, he didn't have to save you, but he saved you. He didn't have to call you and choose you and anoint you and bless you and put his hand of favor on you, but he did it anyway. 
And it's not like he didn't know Peter was going to screw everything up. He did it in spite of Peter. He did it because he loved Peter. And so Peter looked back on all that he had done and realized, hey, there was another boat out there. He didn't have to choose me, but he did. And so every time the devil gets in your mind and in your heart and telling you you've done so much that God doesn't want you, you just remind the devil, he didn't have to choose me, but he chose me in spite of me. He chose me. He chose me. Knowing I would fail, knowing I wouldn't always get it right, he chose me anyway. And can I tell you right now, he's back on the shore for someone who feels like you've done so much that God can never restore you. And he's got a fire built and he's got a fish on it. And he's calling you away from the boat again and saying, let me restore your life. Let me heal you in places you didn't know I could heal you. And John's like, guys, it's so amazing. I just had to write your little PS and tell you, God's love is unbelievable.